Joe Biden voters and other Democrats continue to riot around the country protesting for racial justice or social justice or any kind of justice as long as it isn't actual justice because that would land them in prison. In Portland, for instance, social justice rioter and Fortnite maven Jojo Goodfornot paused in peacefully setting fire to a police cruiser to speak with a woman sobbing at the scene. He said, quote, listen, Mr. Stelter, this is an important expression of my First Amendment right to burn up police cars to protest the fact that there is too much injustice in America. Like you have Americans who are tall and can reach the cereal on the top shelf, and then there are short people who have to jump up and just sort of swipe at the box, hoping it'll fall down so they can grab it. That's totally totally unjust. And as Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So until everyone's the same height, we're going to be living in a country that does not live up to the promises of our founding fathers, many of whom owned slaves and were over six feet tall, unquote. In Chicago, racial justice looter, Frizen of Dread, spoke to a police officer who was driving by in search of someone praying without a mask on. Ms. of Dread said, quote, I will not stop stealing jewelry from this jewelry store until someone gives me jewelry like some of these other women who get rings and necklaces just because they have a boyfriend. And don't even ask me about those women who get stopped for speeding and just have to unbutton one button on their blouse for the police officer to let them go with a warning. It's different for me because I'm black. Okay, I'm not black, but it's different for me because I'm ugly. Plus, I dress like this, unquote. The rioters say they won't stop rioting until life is fair or there's a new season of Stranger Things on Netflix, whichever comes first. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is The Andrew Clavin Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are ringing, also singing, hunky dunky doo Ship shape tipsy topsy the world is a bitty zing It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray, it makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray. All right, we are back. It's Wednesday, mailbag day. We are laughing our way. <laughs> We're screaming our way through the fall of the Republic. Please go on our YouTube channel. We only have 60 million uh, subscribers and we're looking for a gajillion. Uh, so be one of be one of the first to sign up and uh, subscribe. This is the Andrew Clavin YouTube channel, not those other guys at the Daily Wire who cares about them. Also, leave a comment. If it's even droolingly stupid, it will raise the level of the conversation on this show and we'll read it on the air. Here's one from Jeffrey uh, Stafferson. Uh, it says the The left will never be happy until they change the country into their parents' basement so they can live there. Uh, That's almost literally true. That's not even a joke. I mean, (laughs) it's just like give us stuff. And, and, you know, once once you hear a a Democrat politician saying, and we'll do your laundry, you'll know that they have achieved uh, their goals. So whoever is making the decisions for Joe Biden has now selected Kamala Harris to be Biden's running mate and the soon to be president of the United States if he's elected. Uh, It's hard not to be struck. I'm struck by what an incredibly empty ticket this is. A man who isn't there has selected a woman who will say anything to be on a ticket, the main purpose of which is to hide its main purpose, which is leftism. We're now going to hear a lot about how historically black Kamala is. She's part Indian and part Jamaican and about how she's so historically a woman, although I'm not sure how the left can tell what a woman is anymore. But just the fact that the outward show of Kamala Harris is going to be so important underscores the point that it's just about what they look like. This is a ticket of emptiness and opportunism. Joe Biden used to be tough on crime as when he sponsored the 1994 crime bill. Now he maunders on about reassigning police funding to other services. Kamala Harris used to be such a tough prosecutor that she actually hid evidence to keep people in prison. Now she's making noises about defunding the police. Biden was against Me Too charges before he was for them, before he was against them again. And Kamala charged Biden with racism and sexual assault. Now he's the man for her. The entire purpose of this ticket is to serve as a pair of deceptively acceptable faces in order to disguise the slavery of socialism. They're like masks. You know, the masks in the theater, the smiling and the frowning masks, that's what they're like. They're like two masks for socialism, which is, of course, a delusional anti-freedom philosophy that has failed everywhere and is now trying its best to fail here. Essentially, the Democrats are betting everything on their cultural power. They're betting that their news media, which is the news media, their Hollywood, which is Hollywood, and their academy, which is most academies, have grown so powerful and influential that in these last three years, they have managed to make their Trump derangement syndrome 
the nation's Trump derangement syndrome. So we'll even vote for an empty suit and an empty skirt and a failed philosophy rather than reelect an abrasive but highly competent president. They used to say in politics, you can't beat someone with no one, but the Democrats are going to give it a try. It is the ultimate test of the empire of lies. All right, let us talk about Bills.com. You know, the poet John Keats once said that money problems were like having nettles in your bed, stinging nettles in your bed. Anybody who has ever been in debt or has ever struggled uh, to make the bills knows that it is just something that you can't stop thinking about. It's awful. Credit cards, student loans, mortgages, whatever it is, being in debt just stinks. Well, there's a way to defeat your debt, which is bills.com. If you're losing sleep over maxed out credit cards, stressed out thinking about your mortgage payments or student loans, bills.com can help you take back control of your life. The first step to lowering your monthly payments and becoming debt-free is to get a free debt assessment. It only takes a few minutes and could save you hundreds or even thousands of dollars each month. From debt settlement to personal loan consolidation to student loan or mortgage refinancing, bills.com has you covered. They're part of the Freedom Financial Network, which has been in business since 2002 and settled over $2 billion, $10 billion in debt. Take the first step to defeating your debt. Get your free debt assessment today. Go to bills.com slash Clavin. That's bills.com slash Clavin. Bills.com slash Clavin. And I know what you're thinking. I know you're thinking, yes, yes, it is. Just please help me get out of debt. But the important thing is, how do you spell Clavin? It is K-L-A-V-A-N. All right. Like I said, it is Mailbag day today, so all your problems, gather your problems around you, say fond farewell to them, they will all be uh, solved. You know, before we talk about more about this Democrat ticket and about Kamala Harris, there's something else I want to talk about uh, just for a couple of seconds. Uh, this whole campaign that the left is putting up, the campaign is that America uh, is racist, that we are all to blame, that it's a bad country. I mean, it's, it's something they've been selling us for a long time, that we should tolerate the violence in our cities because we deserve it, essentially. Uh, we, we deserve to have people rioting. Uh, they're, they're just expressing uh, the appropriate amount of rage for the you know, wild and rampant killings that the police are supposedly uh, carrying out against black people. All these lies about the nature of our country are not just abandoning us. They're not just abandoning the majority. They're not just putting criminals in front of the good people. They're not just putting the minority, the violent minority, over the uh, law-abiding majority in all neighborhoods. Uh, they're not just doing that. They're also abandoning the rest of the world. I don't know how much you're following what's going on in uh, Hong Kong, but it is pretty bad. They, China is brace, basically bringing down the old, the good old communist boot, that boot that appears wherever communism, socialism, Marxism, whatever you call it, whatever, wherever it appears, the boot follows. And now they've arrested uh, Jimmy Lai. I don't know. He's a, a, a businessman who became a media mogul, uh, a very outspoken guy against the communist regime in Hong Kong, trying to keep the freedom that the British gave Hong Kong, trying to keep it alive. They've now arrested Jimmy Lai and a couple of his kids, too, I believe, and other people because they passed this new law uh, saying that um, they can't associate basically with anyone who disagrees with them, with international people. It was just a law to arrest. Uh, it was just a, a law meant to arrest um, people who, who were against the Chinese. And uh, he was about there were 10 people swept up. Another one was Agnes Chow, a 23 year old politician who was well known for helping to lead pro-democracy protests. And all these guys, we've seen them, have been out on the street fighting for freedom, waving American flags because America represents to them the freedom they want. And it's amazing to me to have them burning flags here. Amazing to me to have them telling us that we're not free, we're racist, we're evil. And when they do that, you know, it's not they do that just to gain power. They do that just to say that, oh, don't don't be disturbed by these riots. You know, they'll all go away once uh, Trump is voted out of office and so forth. They're, they're also abandoning these people. They're abandoning every one of them because they believe in us. They believe in us. And it's one thing to say I disagree with Trump's policies. It's one thing to say I don't like Trump. But to basically hate on this country is the New York Times and all the people who follow the New York Times, which is all the Democrats, all the Joe Biden voters have been doing, is to leave those people fighting for their freedom, fighting for the breath of life in Hong Kong, is to leave them alone and abandon them, just like everybody who owes their freedom to America, which is every single person on this earth who is free. All right, let's get into uh, Kamala Harris. I, I got to show you. Can you put up this New York Times front page? This is one of my fa favorite things ever. Uh, the New York Times front page on this is just, I mean, it is this huge, if you're just listening, you're not watching, huge 
picture of a triumphant uh, Kamala Harris, you know, looking off into the distance with visionary uh, might and all this. And as Harris joins Biden ticket achieving a first and it just takes up the entire page and every word in it, every word is absolutely adulatory. I mean, it's just it's not a bad thing to say about her. Uh, one, one says my favorite one uh, was she's a pragmatic moderate. <laughs> and the other one is the, the pick is seen as safe, but energizing. I always love the passive tense in New York Times reporting, which means we see it uh, as safe, but energizing. But it's seen. It's just seen. It's out there. The, the eyes of the world, those invisible eyes of all the world see this pick as safe, but energizing, which, of course, is, it's none of those things. Uh, and, of, and of course, a woman of color in major slot, uh, in slot of major party. But this is as opposed to when Sarah Palin uh, was appointed uh, and they wrote uh, they their headline was Alaska. Alaskan is McCain's choice. First woman on a GOP ticket. And then the, the, the opening lines of the story was Senator John McCain astonished the political world on Friday by naming Sarah Palin, a little known governor of Alaska and self-described hockey mom with almost no foreign policy experience as his running mate on the Republican presidential ticket. So history only goes <laughs> one way. Uh, and, and, you know, it is the funny thing about this identity politics. One of the things we're going to hear because these two people, Joe Biden, who is obviously not there anymore, and Kamala Harris, who was there because they wanted a woman and the uh, black, you know, leadership said we were going to have to have a, a black woman, even though Kamala Harris was rejected by the black voters. We don't forget this. She was rejected by the black voters uh, in favor of Joe Biden. So that just it shows you that they wanted Joe Biden because he was the face of moderation. He was the face of the old Democratic Party, that old, you know, Kennedy Party that you, some people can still remember that is now nothing uh, like what's there today. Uh, and so they had to, to pick this thing. But the thing about identity politics, is it's always like this. It is always like this. Tim Graham at Newsbusters just goes back and looks at some of the things they said, because every every time now that Kamala Harris gets attacked, it's going to be because she's a woman, right? They're already forming a committee, the committee to make sure that she is covered fairly and not just... Let, let's just look at Tim Graham's article at Newsbusters about how they treated Sarah Palin, okay? Uh, it says, within minutes of her appointment, CNN reporter John Roberts, who's now on Fox News, suggested Palin might turn out to be a crummy mother. There's also the issue, he said, this is a quote, that on April 18th, she gave birth to a baby with Down syndrome. Children with Down syndrome require an awful lot of attention. The role of vice president, it seems to me, would take up an awful lot of her time. It raises the issue of how much time will she have to dedicate to her newborn child. ABC anchor Bill Weir piled on, asking one campaign aide, adding to the brutality of a national campaign, the Palin family also has an infant with special needs. What leads you, the senator and the governor, to believe that one won't affect the other And the, in the next couple of months? You can't be a mom and be vice president. NBC anchor Amy Robach asked if Sarah Palin becomes vice president, will she be shortchanging her kids or will she be shortchanging the country? Washington Post columnist Sally Quinn suggested mothers couldn't handle the demands of the vice presidency. Her first priority has to be her children. When the phone rings at three in the morning and one of her children is really sick, what choice will she make? Now, let me be honest with you. I don't believe new mothers should go back to work either. I believe you should, being a mother is a full-time job, at least for the first five years. Absolutely. But what if I went out and said that? If I went out and said it, if I went out and said it to uh, a left-wing candidate, of course, of course, I would be a horrible, horrible, sexist person. And I have the benefit of being an actual horrible, horrible, sexist person, so they can't get me on that. It's just like, yeah, that's, that's what I am. But they're not supposed to be that. So it's all an illusion. And it really underscores, it underscores what identity politics is. I mean, we all know this, that it has nothing to do with helping the actual people. It has nothing to do with women. It has nothing to do with blacks. All the Black Lives Matter stuff in the world has, it obviously has nothing to do with blacks because they're not doing anything to help the blacks who are being murdered en masse in cities like Chicago uh, by other blacks with guns. They're not do doing anything about that. It's all about illusion. And why is it about illusion? It is because this force is driving the Democratic Party, this force of progressivism. And they call it progressivism because it is progressive, like emphysema is progressive, like cancer is progressive. It progresses on its own logic, like all philosophies. I mean, you know, Christian philosophy changed the world, but it changed the world over centuries, over millennia. Uh, but 
philosophies work themselves out to their fine, final conclusions. And that's what progressivism does. And one of the things, ways that progressivism does that is it starts to lie because the point about progressivism is its overarching philosophy is the world will be a perfect place as soon as you give me and my party enough power to simply define reality and make people do what we need them to do. And the opposite of that is what we would call, say, oh, Americanism, where your individual decisions are going to raise the level of the uh, country by by you just ba- trying to make life better for you and your family, you'll raise the whole country. So there's two opposite ways of looking at the world. Either the world should be run from the top down, or it should be run from the bottom up. And so it always uh, progressivism always moves in this direction, has done since the French Revolution. And these people are just there, just to represent different things. You know, Joe Biden is there to represent good old-fashioned liberal democracy from the uh, 60s and 70s, and Kamala Harris is there to represent women and uh, people with brown faces. That's what they're there for, but they're just masks on this philosophy, this philosophy that is moving like a steamroller to toward enslaving the country and destroying the Constitution, which is its point. And always, I just want to, we'll talk about the politics of this in a moment, but one thing that is always comes up, of course, because the vice presidential pick is usually one of the people who was running for president in the primaries, there's always a wealth of material about the things that the vice president said about the person who is going to be the president. But in this case, I have to tell you that it's pretty amazing. I mean, one of these things is she, you remember her famous moment, Kamala Harris's famous moment in the debates was when she said that uh, Joe Biden had opposed busing, which Kamala Harris also opposed, and the moment when she basically accused him of supporting segregationists. This is cut 15. It's personal, and I was actually very, it was hurtful to hear you talk about the reputations of two United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. And it was not only that, but you also worked with them to oppose busing. And, you know, there was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools. And she was bused to school every day. And that little girl was me. Oh, God, I'm just, I'm just so moved by that. You know, so he's against busing. She accused him of supporting segregationists. And, and this is the other one. When he was accused of all those women of misbehaving, the Me Too charges, she believed them. She said that she believed these things. This is uh, 17. I believe them, and I, I respect um them being able to tell their story and having the courage to do it. Do you believe that the vice president should enter this race? Oh, I, he's going to have to make that decision for himself. I wouldn't tell him what to do. <laughs> so he's a segregationist, woman abuser, and he's the man for me. <laughs> I just, I just, it just, just takes this to a new level. There's always this stuff. I mean, you could go back to Bush and Reagan, and Bush would attack Reagan for voodoo economics and then became his vice president. But I don't know. You're a sexual abuser and a segregationist. And yes, I'm on your ticket. That's co- quite a uh, something to overcome. Trump does not look uh, too worried about this. Uh, this is his reaction cut uh, six, I think, yeah. She was my number one pick. I mean, she was, as they would say, because hopefully you'll start college football. She was my number one draft pick. And we'll see how she works out. She did very, very poorly in the uh, primaries, as you know. She was expected to do well. And she was, she ended up at right around 2% and spent a lot of money. She had a lot of things happening. And so I was a little surprised that he picked her. It's, it's really a kind of strange pick to me because on the one hand, she is, I'll discuss this a little bit more, but she was, she's a far leftist, which means that she's not going to gain any grounds among the moderate middle. But on the other hand, as a prosecutor, you know, she really put forward this top cop, such, such a top, tough uh, cop that she actually lied to keep people in prison and hid evidence. Um, and that's going to alienate the sort of Black Lives Matter movement, this whole movement of people uh, saying we should get rid of the police. I mean, the problem with is with uh, our neighborhoods is not criminality. It's the police. So it's I really don't understand what they pick up on this except for that face. You know, it's a, it's a black female face. I mean, I don't understand what they're going to get out of this. 
Uh, they were kind of backed into a corner with it. Obviously, it's not Joe Biden's decision. Joe Biden can't decide whether, whether to have the gruel uh, or the slop for breakfast. But whoever was making this decision, I just think they got backed into a corner because I do not see how it helps them uh, in the ele- on the electoral map. I don't see how it helps them with their base. I don't see how it really is going to help them at all, except the press is going to do their best to make it seem like an act of genius. All right, let us talk about one of our favorite sponsors, tra- Stamps.com. You do not want, especially if you live in L.A., you don't want to go to the post office, even though the post office has great service. I've, as a writer, I've lived off the post office my whole life. But like everything else, I want the post office in my computer. And that's where Stamps.com comes in. With Stamps.com, you can print postage on demand, avoid going to the post office, and you'll save money with discounted rates you can't even get if you went to the post office. Stamps.com also offers UPS services with discounts up to 62% and no residential surcharges. Stamps.com brings all the mailing and shipping services you need right to your computer in the comfort of your home and office, whether you're a small business sending invoices and online sellers shipping out products or just working from home and need to mail stuff, stamps.com can handle it all with ease. And right now, my listeners get a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. It's a cool scale, too. It's electronic. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and figure out how to type in Clavin. That's stamps.com. Enter Clavin. You're going to be going K. Wait a minute. It's K. Uh, K-L-A, is there an E? No, there are no E's in Clavin. I just there make it work. No E's <laughs> this, this easy. You know, this thing about her being a tough prosecutor, which really is bothering some of them on the left, um, the uh, Shavona Newsom, the Marxist uh, co-founder of Black Lives Matter, says this top cop thing has just stuck. She built such a strong brand on it as an AG, as the DA, and it's hard for people to erase that in their memories. But it's not just, you know, you, you, you think that Trump, the law and order president, is going to have a hard time uh, attacking her uh, for being tough on crime, right? You can't really say, well, I'm the law and order and she was too tough on crime. But it's the dishonesty. It really is bad dishonesty. Tulsi Gabbard had her big moment in the debates by just tearing her apart on this. Play that one. Senator Harris says she's proud of her record as a prosecutor and that she'll be a prosecutor president. But I'm deeply concerned about this record. There are too many examples to cite, but she put over 1,500 people in jail for marijuana violations and then laughed about it when she was asked if she ever smoked marijuana. She blocked evidence. She blocked evidence that would have freed an innocent man from death row until the courts forced her to do so. She kept people in prison beyond their sentences to use them as cheap labor for the state of California. And she fought to keep cash bail system in place that impacts poor people in the worst kind of way. You know, this is interesting. During the primaries back in 2019, there was an article in the New York Times. Uh, and I have to be careful here. This article was written by Lara Bazelon, who is one of my favorite people on earth. She's at my, actually my cousin. Lara Bazelon and Emily Bazelon also writes progressive uh, legal articles for the New York Times, and they're both my beloved cousins. Uh, but she was, Lara, who was a very bright uh, public defender, uh, was uh, basically saying this is not a progressive uh, person, but it's it's the dishonesty that gets me. He talks about Kevin Cooper, a death row inmate whose trial was infected by racism and corruption. He sought advanced DNA testing to prove his innocence, but Miss Harris opposed it. And after the New York Times expose of the case went va- viral, then she reversed her opinion. Her uh, Her record in wrongful conviction cases uh, includes George Gage, an electrician with no criminal record who was charged in 1999 with sexually abusing his stepdaughter who reported the allegation years later. And the case largely hinged on the stepdaughter's testimony. And Mr. Gage was convicted and she hid evidence again. Uh, She fought to keep Daniel Larson in prison on a 28 year to life sentence for possession of a concealed weapon, even though his trial lawyer was incompetent and there was compelling evidence of his innocence. You know, Prosecutors, I've known a lot of prosecutors, and I've always really liked prosecutors. I've always really gotten along with them. And most of them, you know, they're not like defense attorneys who will say and do anything to get their client off. They don't care what they say. They don't care how guilty they know he is. It doesn't matter. Prosecutors don't do that. If a prosecutor uh, thinks you're innocent, he's supposed to just say, okay, well, justice has to be done because he represents the state. So you want him doing something different. So, you know, it, it really is, it, she really was like not just a tough 
prosecutor. She was a dishonest prosecutor. She was a prosecutor who defended basically her own record instead of justice. And now, talk about hypocrisy, now she's been getting on the bandwagon about defunding the police, talking about the LAPD. Uh, This is cut 26. Many cities spend over one third of their entire city budget on policing. But meanwhile, we've been defunding public schools for years in America. We've got to re-examine what we're doing with American taxpayer dollars and ask the question, are we getting the right return on our investment? Are we actually creating healthy and safe communities? And that's a legitimate conversation and it requires a a really critical evaluation. I applaud Eric Garcetti for doing what he's done. That's that's pretty amazing. I mean, it's pretty amazing for a woman who hid DNA evidence, uh, who hid evidence to keep people in prison on death row, to now suddenly say, "Well, the real problem is we're giving too much money to the police." It's it's just it's it's not a question of tough on crime or not tough on crime. It's a question of absolute self-serving. Um, hypocrisy, basically. She's a bad. This is a bad person. The way she treated Brett Kavanaugh was ugly, ugly stuff. That. Uh, Attempts to uh, get sucker him into a uh, perjury trap by asking him this stupid question about whether he talked to somebody at a law firm. And when Kavanaugh said, you know, I don't know who works for that law firm, she basically accused him of avoiding, uh, of, of just trying to lie. And that was, a, it was a big moment. All these things in the moment were big deal uh, to the press. But of course, they just vanished. It was completely ineffective uh, and ineffectual on top of being dishonest. And this thing about her being a moderate, which you're going to hear and hear and hear, is just garbage. She is a radical. And when I say that she's a radical, I don't mean in her heart she's a radical. I mean she's going to jump on any train that is going to get her the power that she wants. And that train is now a radical train. Uh, She definitely wants to seize your guns as cut two. We have got to have smart gun safety laws in this country. And we've got to stop buying this false choice. You can be in favor of the Second Amendment and also understand that there is no reason in a civil society that we have assault weapons around communities that can kill babies and police officers. I will give the United States Congress 100 days to get their act together and have the courage to pass reasonable gun safety laws. And if they fail to do it, then I will take executive action. She will take executive action to cancel the Second Amendment. Uh, You know, and not only that, she wants to ban plastic straws, which are actually in the Constitution. I mean, that's, you know, the right to have plastic straws shall not be abridged. But, you know, she her health, she wants the uh, the universal health care that will destroy your right to have uh, private insurance. Uh, She's talked about that. You know, the big thing, though, is let's play cut 21 when she talks about what the tax rate should be. And she's promoting policies like saying that every single carbon emission in the country, every car should be eliminated within the next 11 years, everything from a 70 to 80 percent tax rate. Do you agree that she could possibly in this ideology of the socialist left could splinter your party? No, you know, I think that um, she is challenging the status quo. I think that's fantastic. I think I think that she is introducing bold ideas that that should be discussed. And I think it's good for the party. I frankly think it's good for the country. Let's look at the bold ideas. But now let's talk about the way she thinks about money. If she's saying it's okay to talk about a 70 to 80 percent tax rate, uh, look at cut 22 when she talks about what things cost. $3 $3 trillion a year for Medicare for all by some studies. I don't, depending on which portions of the Green New Deal you pick to do first, that's money. Uh, that you know what the Republicans are going to say, tax and spend liberals, pie in the sky. One of the things that I admire and respect is the measurement that is captured in three letters, ROI. Mm-hmm. What's the return on the investment? People in the private sector understand this really well. It's not about a cost, it's about an investment. And then the question should be, is it worth the cost in terms of the investment potential? Are we going to get back more than we put in? I, this always bug, bugs me. Obama used to make arguments like this, too. And what bugs me about it is they're investing your money. They never talk about this. They always say, well, it's an investment. But an investment in what? Am I going to get a return on that investment? Am I going to get paid back uh, when you spend, when you take 70 to 80 percent of my uh, money away in taxes, am I going to get 90% back? Is, the, is it my investment or is it your investment? Why are you investing my money? Conservatives never talk about this. They never talk. They always talk about the fact that socialism doesn't work, but they never talk about the fact that it's simply immoral. Why is it moral? Uh, if, why is, if it's immoral for you to rob me with a gun, is it moral for you to rob me with the government? 
I don't, I don't understand that. I've never understood why conservatives don't wait, make this argument more often. And part of it is because of the old uh, fact that when you pass something into law, people immediately respect it. But why should they respect thuggery uh, in, in, in under cover of law? This, all of this stuff, though, all of this stuff is only important in that it points out how empty these people are. She would have said something else if something else would have gotten her in. We know this because we've seen her do it. I've just showed you her doing it, saying different things at different times, being different people at different times. Joe Biden doesn't know what he's saying. I mean, I, that's half a joke, but it's not really. I mean, it's it, the guy is really uh, in no shape. That's going to be your, your president if Joe Biden gets elected, if they manage to somehow shove him over the finish line into office. And you're just it's just about. This philosophy, it is just about the force of this philosophy, which has now exploded into full, a full mental disorder. And that's the philosophy that they're trying to get into the White House because it means power for them to arrange the world the way they sh- think it should be, something which has never, ever worked, not even once. All right. Let us talk about ZipRecruiter, because I know many of you look at look at my show and you say, how could you let that happen? And it's because we just didn't use ZipRecruiter to hire these people. I mean, you, you know, I, we can't show you this behind the scenes, but it's like you ever see that clown car, the Volkswagen come out in the clown? That's that's what it looks like behind the scenes of my show. But ZipRecruiter, if you need to hire someone, ZipRecruiter will send the job, your job proposal to over 100 of the web's leading job sites. And they don't stop there. They have powerful matching technology with which ZipRecruiter scans thousands of resumes to find people with the right experience and actively invite them to apply to your job. ZipRecruiter makes the entire hiring process efficient and effective with features like screening questions to filter candidates and an all-in-one dashboard where you can review and rate your candidates. ZipRecruiter is so effective that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. Do not let your business look like my show right now. <laughs> ZipRecruiter for free. My listeners can go to ZipRecruiter.com slash Clavin. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash Clavin. ZipRecruiter.com slash Clavin. The smartest way to hire. You can say, I do not want my show, my business to look like that show that's spelled uh, K-L-A-V-A-N. There are no <laughs> That's Ain't it the truth? All right. Also, you want to get a membership because this week I'm going to solve all the problems from the people in the mailbag, but you can't be in the mailbag if you don't have a subscription to Daily Wire and you want to get their best subscription, which is All Access. All Access members get to join All Access Live, our exclusive live stream Q&As hosted every night by each of the hosts, sometimes including even me. That's that's how high level this thing goes. All Access membership also features exclusive access to live online discussions with our hosts, writers, and special guests. Plus, You get not one, but two leftist tears tumblers, which means you can actually mix your leftist tears like a martini in your uh, tumblers. Head over to dailywire.com slash Clavin right now to get 20% off all access with coupon code access. That's dailywire.com slash Clavin with coupon code (laughs) access to get 20% off your membership. How do you you spell Clavin? Uh, Never mind. All right. The mailbag is coming right up. Mailbag. Woo! <laughs> ah, 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 whoa, ah, oh, no, ow, oh, no, don't, ow, oh, not there, no, ah, ah, ooh, ah, oh. <laughs> I I have no comment. I don't know what that that even means. All right, we have uh, just one video question today, but we'll lead off with it. Uh, This is from Aaron. Hey, O'Clavin, Lord of Light, reflected off the shiny head. My name's Aaron, and I'm a pastor in the United Methodist Church. I'm in a season of sermon planning right now, and that made me wonder as I was thinking about different things to preach about, what do you believe the church needs to hear right now? Are there certain aspects of the gospel, of the Bible, of the kingdom of God, or the Christian worldview uh, that especially need to be lifted up uh, in our day currently? Uh, Or to put it another way, what would the Clavin preach? You ought to know, too, that I have been known to once or twice sprinkle in a little Clavin-y goodness, talked about playing in pain, things people do to avoid shame by uh, talking about themselves better than they really are. Uh, So I want to thank you for your wisdom. And as the founder of my movement, John Wesley would say, save the Clavin. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, love, I love this question because I, it, there's more than one time uh, I have turned to my wife while we've been having coffee in the morning in bed and chatting. 
and just said, what does it take to get people to preach the gospel? Just talk about what is in uh, the gospel. So I actually uh, like the question. I mean, I cannot tell you how often uh, I come, I've come home from church and, you know, uh, if my wife wasn't with me, she'll say, what did they talk about? And, they, and I'll say, eh, they said, be nice. You know, they said, be nice. It's either be nice or give us money. That's basically what I, I get from most sermons. And when they actually do interpret the gospel, it's almost always to interpret it away. It's almost always to uh, make us feel fine about the fact that, um, you know, we're not actually following the gospel, but we think it sounds, it sounds nice. What I want to know, what I want to know out of, out of the gospel is not so much theology. Theology is really interesting, but I want to know, I, I feel like God has got theology. I feel that's in his, I, you know, I don't, I don't care. I, it's not that I don't care who's saved and who's damned. I, I don't have any vote in that. I want to know how I'm supposed to live. I want to know why this philosophy is so radical that it changed the world. And, and the thing about it is, Jesus never said, you will change the world. In fact, he said the opposite. He said, give your money to the poor, but the poor you will have always with you. He said, if you follow my philosophy, the world will hate you. The world will persecute you for my sake. So he never said, this is going to make the world a better place. What he said was it was going to give you eternal life. And not only was it going to give you eternal life, it was going to give you life in abundance. It was going to give you joy. He said, I want you to feel the joy that I feel. So what was it he saying? Because it can't be, it can't be that what he meant was go to the charity golf tournament. It can't be that what he meant was do charity work, all of which is great. You know, it's not that churches shouldn't uh, have charity work, but clearly this guy saw something that other people didn't see. Why was he saying, love your enemies? Are you really supposed to love your enemies? Can you still kill them if you love them? What does it mean? I Every time I hear the the what they call the lectionary in the Episcopal Church, the, where they read the actual passage that they're going to preach on. I think, wow, that is amazing that he said that, and I don't even know uh, how that applies to my life. And and basically, I find the preachers will tell you like, well, <clears throat> you know, what it really means is be nice and give the church money. Be nice, give the church money. Be nice, give or or uh, sometimes ascribe to some leftist stupid social justice thing. And none of that is in the Gospels. I've read them a million times, and none of that is in there. What he is saying is genuinely radical, and I don't think that preachers step back enough and take a look at what it is about this this, uh, relationship with Jesus that changes your life. Because I've talked about it a lot. I mean, I've talked, when I go and talk to evangelicals, and I love evangelicals, they're some of the nicest people on earth. But, you know, and I say to them, gee, what does it mean, judge not, lest you be judged? And they say, well, it means don't judge hypocritically. I didn't need this God to come incarnate himself to tell me not to judge hypocritically. I think we all know we shouldn't judge hypocritically. That's not what it says. It says judge not. It says judge not. And I mean, this is is really important stuff to me. Uh, It really matters. Love your enemies. What what does that mean? Do I really do that? Uh, Do I really turn the other cheek when somebody slaps me? Why is it that I feel really good when somebody says, I never turn the other cheek? Why do I think, ah, that's, you know. What what is he saying that's so radical? Why did they crucify the guy? They don't crucify you for going around saying, don't forget to be at the charity golf tournament. It must have been something that he was saying that is transformative. I have found it transformative in my life. Uh, I'll talk about it. I'll write about it. I've talked about it here. I'm writing about it now. I think that uh, when you preach, that's what you should be talking about. What does this mean to the guy or girl in the pew that is going to be so radical that it really will increase your uh, life in abundance? It can't just mean give me money and it can't just mean, you know, like uh, you're off the hook or in some way. All right. Uh, um, so that's what I like to hear. I like to hear the gospel preached. I'd like to hear a mind engaging with what is actually in the gospels. From Morocco, uh, Archmage Clavin. That is actually one of my business cards. So about two years ago, uh, I first started being attracted to my best friend's sister. Uh, not that big of a deal, right? Except that I was 16 and she was 12. At first, I didn't realize what was happening, but every time we hung out together, the feelings would grow. Our families are close and we see each other frequently. For two years, I have been feeling very attracted to her. So now you're 18 and she's 14. Uh, it's not sexually. I, I just want to spend every second with her. My dilemma is that I don't know if she feels the same way towards me. I think she might and she sort of acts like she might, but I can't tell. And I don't know if I can tell her how I feel because of the age gap. I know that I will have to wait until 
until she is 18 to start a serious relationship, and I'm willing to wait, but I also don't know how to deal with the stress and anxiety that comes with thinking about other guys her age making advances. We're both Catholic, uh, and I have felt for a long time that she is the one. I've prayed and meditated on this, and I don't understand why God would make me feel such strong feelings if she wasn't the one. Uh, so I guess what I'm asking is, should I let her know how I feel uh, and how do I make, if I have to wait, how do I make the wait easier? Uh, a, a tough problem and a real problem, uh, and I sympathize, but no, you can't talk to her. She's 14 years old. Uh, she does not need the feelings of an 18-year-old uh, clogging up her life. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to put a sock on it for now. I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm not saying she's not the one. She might be, but you're going to have to wait. I, I would say, you say 18, I would say 17 is fine, but let her have her life. Let her grow up, back off. You know, you can be kind to her. You can be loving to her. You can ch- chat with her. Uh, but do not express your feelings. And the thing that I would do, to be honest with you, is is I, I would date. I, I would get to know other girls. I would get to have some experience with other girls. You know, you don't have to, um, you know, you can make it as serious or not as you want. Uh, but I would live your life. She is going to have to live her life. She's going to have to grow up. She 14 is too young to have an 18 year old uh, making love to you. And uh, and I don't mean that, in, obviously, in the physical sense, but I mean in any way, you know, what they what they used to call pitching woo. I don't I don't think uh, she's old enough for that. So go out and live your life. Let her live her life, and and uh, and let you live your life. If you are right, and she is the one, and God means for her to be the one, she'll be there when you're seventeen, when she's seventeen, and you'll be what you'll be twenty one, which is fine. And it, it, when she's seventeen, and you go to her and say, "Look, I've always uh, felt this way about you," then you'll find out the answer. You're just going to have to live with it. You're just going to have to suck it up. If if she's the one, you owe it to her to let her live her life and to go off and live your life and make sure that you have a kind of wide scope of experience uh, with other people to to make sure that this these feelings which come from being close to her are real. You can't do it now. You're absolutely right to wait, and you have to keep waiting. You're just going to have to, and you know, you're just going to have to tough it out. Um, from Kay, my question about a situation with my 20-year-old daughter. She's always been the good girl, uh, self-disciplined, well-behaved, but she recently returned from a year and a half at college, reunited with her high school boyfriend, and now wants to move in with him. My husband and I are against this, but we don't, we know we can't really stop her. Uh, she knows we feel this way uh, and says even though she loves us, she disagrees with us. Uh, and her boyfriend, she said that she and her boyfriend have prayed about it and feel God is guiding them in this decision. We have told her that if she really loves us and God, she would respect us enough not to go against our wishes, especially since she's still very dependent on us. Um, I would love your thoughts on this. Well, well, look, if she's dependent on you and if you mean she's financially dependent on you, uh, here is what I would do. OK, um, first of all, stop haranguing her. If, if she's going to do this, she's going to do it. She is going to make her own decisions. She's going to make her own mistakes. Also, stop supporting her. You should not be paying for her to live with somebody if you feel that living with somebody is wrong. And so you should tell her, we love you. We respect your right to make this decision. But we also have the decision to make, which is we don't want to pay for, for you while you're doing this. And I don't mean it punitively. I don't mean that you, you know, d- don't you dare move in with this guy uh, or we're not going to support you. But you have a right to live by your lights, too. You're telling her that she has the right to live by her lights, which I think is right. Uh, even if you disagree, she has the right to live by her lights. You have the right to live by your lights, which is that you don't want to spend money on this particular arrangement. Um, you know, you have strong feelings about it, but but again, stop haranguing her about it. Stop that. You, she, you, you told her your opinion. She heard your opinion. She knows what you think. You should not be just beating up on her all the time. If she's going to move in with somebody, let her move in with somebody, but let her prove she has the courage of her convictions and make sure that you're not paying for something that you think is is sinful and wrong. And so I think that uh, you're not as helpless as you think here in, in the sense that you have the right to at least take a stand in your life. In the same way that she's living by her lights, you should live by your lights. That's, that's what's on the... Uh, on the table. That's what's in the cards. And so you shouldn't feel that you have to pay for her doing something that you feel sin- sinful. You shouldn't tell her she can't visit you. You shouldn't tell her she can't bring over her laundry. You shouldn't tell her she can't have dinner with you. It's not, not nothing like that. It's just that you don't want to pay for a lifestyle that you don't feel is the right lifestyle. Um, from Anonymous, uh, you often mention taking Christ's words as they are. I was talking about this example uh, before. Uh, don't judge lest you be judged. Of course, you've mentioned that East Passions shouldn't be taken literally. When Jesus says, I'm the door, it means he's not, not literally a door. Uh, my question is, how do you understand communion with Christ's words? If you do not eat my flesh or drink my blood, you will never have eternal life. As a separate question in general, what are your thoughts on the Catholic interpretation of the sacrament of the Eucharist and transubstantiation? Appreciate your time. I write about this a little bit in my memoir, The Great Good Thing, uh, and it's an artist's perspective. Well, transubstantiation does not mean uh, that the uh, bread turns into 
uh, flesh. I mean, it's still bread. It means that the substance of the bread uh, turns into flesh. Well, what does that mean? It means that the uh, essence, the, the essential essence, the substance of the bread uh, becomes the essence of, uh, of Christ's flesh. And this is the whole message to me of Christianity. I mean, the, a central message of Christianity that matter represents spirit. Matter is the language of spirit. The, the word became flesh. The things that we can't see, morality, uh, relationships, love, the things that are principles, like mathematics is a principle, like two is a principle. You can't see two, uh, but we can write a symbol for two in the same way God can write the symbol of his word in Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And so what Jesus is saying is that uh, this this bread and this wine become, in essence, um, the my my flesh and my blood, and you cannot, uh, you can't um, be saved until you uh, take this into yourself, and and you become also a representative of God's word in your own separate individual way. This is why, as an artist, I've never understood why Catholics and Protestants killed themselves, killed each other over this question. Because to me, this is what symbolism is. When you say something's a symbol, uh, it means that the mind perceives in it the other thing. So that, to me, is what uh, transubstantiation is. I understand. Don't write to me. Don't tell me that this is not the way uh, you understand it, not the way the church understands it. I know that. People burned each other at the stake over this, so I know it's not the way they understand it. But as an artist, that's the way I see it. When something symbolizes it, it essentially becomes that in substance. And so what I think this is, is, is that it's not just bread and wine that become Jesus Christ. The whole world, the whole word of God is Jesus Christ. And so everything you see, every action you take, every parable that Jesus tells is matter representing uh, spirit. And that's why when Paul says live into the spirit of things, he means live into the meaning of it. When you take an action, remember your action has a meaning. It's not a random action. When you climb into bed with somebody, it's not just an action. It's not just uh, pieces of flesh going into other pieces of flesh. It's actually a moral uh, act taking place. And that's true with whatever you do. And that's what I think uh, communion does. It is communing with that meaning in the flesh because Jesus is both is both the word and the flesh. And that's what you're trying to do by taking in his flesh. You're taking in the word and becoming a representation of the spirit of God. That's my interpretation of it. Again, you don't have to write me and tell me it's not everybody's interpretation. I already know that, but there it is for you. I got to stop there. I hope that was helpful. I'm Andrew Clavin. This is The Andrew Clavin Show. The Andrew Clavin Show is produced by Robert Sterling. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Technical producer, Austin Stevens. Our supervising producer is Mathis Glover. Assistant director is Pavel Wadowski. Edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio mixed by Robin Fenderson. Hair and makeup, or head and makeup, by Nika Geneva. Animations are by Cynthia Angulo. Production assistants, McKenna Waters and Ryan Love. The Andrew Claven Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire. 2020. Joe Biden picks his VP, hip hop somehow becomes even more degrading, and a Republican governor agrees to speak at the Democratic National Convention. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show.